Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the HDB Serials and All Seeds December webinar. Uh, my name is Richard Meredith and it's my, my honour to chair this webinar for, for you all today. Um, so what's the theme today? Mitigating high fertiliser prices. Given the current prices in, in the marketplace, uh, we've brought together all the tools, resources and information um, which AHDB um, has provided um, on this topic. So before we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to quickly whiz through the housekeeping before we hand over to our first um, speaker. So if I go to the housekeeping um, for, for this event, um, you are all on mute. Um, so we don't worry, we can't hear you or see you. Um, but if you do have any questions on the right hand side of your of your screen, there should be a questions box. Um, please, we do encourage um, people to to write in the questions. They give us a, we've got a good session um, designed at the end of it where we can ask, ask all the panel the questions that, to your heart's content. Um, so please do do that. We we've got an hour and a half slot. We'll see how we we get on. Um, we um, we have that built-in um, question bit at the end. Um, so we've got lots of people um, signing up. There's just shy of 900 people registered for this event. So I'm anticipating a few a few discussion points coming in at the end. If you do miss anything, can you, you kind of frantically scribbling down notes or anything? The webinar is recorded, and um, after as soon after it's um, finished, it gets put up onto the HDB Serials and All Seeds YouTube site. And the simple way to find that is typing HDB YouTube into Google. Um, if you do want to collect basis or Neuroso points, um, then you will need to um, enter into the questions box your um, basis or Neuroso details. So those are your name, your, your basis or Neuroso number, your date of birth and your postcode. Um, if you enter those into the questions box, we'll, we'll take them all down afterwards and send them off to, to collect the points. Thanks, Michelle. The only other bit of outside kind of housekeeping to make you aware of, as I said, we've got lots to get through and I'm keen not to, to kind of take up too much time, is that is we've, um, at HDB, we've opened the Shape the Future, the, the, the campaign towards the vote, um, which all levy payers have um, this, this coming spring. It's very important that you all register um, to, to take part in that vote. It's a really quick Kind of, I did one with somebody the other day. It took about two minutes to register their details, um, and then when the voting happens, it opens and you you get all the details. Go onto the HDB website; all the details are on there. All I can say is it's the opportunity for you all to um, to to shape the future of what you want the organisation to look like. Um, all the products, tools, and services that HDB will be will be included in the voting process, and you can go through and really kind of tell us which ones you value and which ones you don't, and what what you want it to look like going forward. Thank you, Michelle. Today's webinar, uh, we've got four different speakers um, coming coming to you. First off, we've got my colleague James Holmes, who works in the environment team. Uh, James is going to be taking us through the, the HDB resources in crop nutrition and, and what they look like and what you can get from them. Um, then we'll be going straight over to, to Pete Berry from ADAS. Uh, Pete's going to be talking about how you understand best understand your um, economic optimum of how much nitrogen to apply. And this is some very recent and reactive work that, that Pete and his, his colleagues have been working on um, to, to help explain that. And then we'll be going over and talking about the kind of the financial side of it with, with and the trends from um, Mark Topliff. Uh, Mark's a senior analyst at AHDB and he's going to be bringing some point, some of the, the data that we sit on and, um, and showing us the trends and that we have, have for the fertilizer prices and, and how, how they relate to the, to the yields. And then finally, not last but not least, um, we've got Helen Plant. Um, Helen works in the, the market intelligence uh, side of AHDB, and she's going to be looking at the relationship between um, the fertilizer prices and the grain prices, and what they're looking like for the, for the future, and, and how they fit into this whole whole topic. So that's that's enough for me. I'm, I'm going to hand over to James. Like I said, James is going to take us through the the the, um, the HDB resources in crop nutrition and and what you can use them for to to help better your your business and your productivity. So um, thank you very much, James, and, and I'll go over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon, everybody. Michelle, could you move me on one slide, please? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what AHDB can offer you. Um, first and foremost, we have an expert team at AHDB, really knowledge, lots of um, knowledgeable, very experienced team. Um, the, the the next two parts of you know of, of our core offering are a fantastic knowledge exchange program. 
So we have on-farm trials, we have tryouts, we have demonstrations. So some of those trials are randomized and replicated out on, on strategic farms. Some of those are, are, are pieces of work where we might split the field down the middle and try one thing uh, on one half and, and another on an, uh, perhaps farm practice on, on the other side of the field. You know, not necessarily the most scientific of trials, but once we've shown what can work scientifically, we can demonstrate that that can really work out on farm as well with, um, with one of our monitor or strategic farms actually trying that out in real life and incredibly valuable. You have then the confidence that it, it, it's been shown to work scientifically, that might be a new rate or a timing, but then you know, shown very clearly it can work out on farm as well. It might be a demonstration of a, a new piece of um, technology. Um, and then of course, as part of that, that um, uh, knowledge exchange platform as well. We also have benchmarking uh, and, and the economic analysis that that offers, which is um, uh, you know a fantastic complement to the science that we do. Is a bit actually being able to demonstrate what economic effect that 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 has, and and how how you might be able to compare yourselves against others um, in in perhaps in the local area, or even nationally. And then complementing our knowledge exchange program, we have a really, you know, a very robust research program that we, we run up and down the country, across the UK. Um, and just by way, way of example, we've worked on wheat, oats and barley over the last three years. That's to produce um, new recommendations for modern varieties of, of, of those crops. Um, and we've also um, revised RB29 and our guidance around phosphorus, lime, soil and grain sampling as well. So just ensuring that, that you have the most up-to-date recommendations and the best guidance that's available. Next slide, please, Michelle. So in terms of our team, uh, there are uh, seven of us in the team. The team's led by, by John Foote, uh, myself and Harley working on soil health and climate change, supported by uh, Nicola, uh, Nicola, who works on water quality, Amanda on soil health, uh, George and Alice both working on crop nutrition and soils. And I really would encourage you, if you have any questions, please do fire those ac across to us and, and we'll do, do our best to answer those um, um, uh, as quickly as we can. Um, you can get all of our contact details at, uh, at the AHDB website, ahdb.org.uk forward slash meet the team. Thank you, Michelle. In terms of on-farm trials, we have a, a huge number of trials run across the country, um, uh, and I'm pretty sure there will be, be some close to you. But just a, a, a few examples here of, of, of trials, so randomized uh, and, and replicated largely, not always, but, but largely at strategic farms. Um, we have three strategic um, farms at the moment. Uh, one in the, the east, one in the west, uh, uh, and then a farm in Scotland. And I think actually there is a, a new strategic farm coming online uh, just down by the South Downs as well. Um, but those trials will be starting this spring. Um, and we have a, a range of, of trials there that, that are, are run on those farms that complement the research that we've done, but demonstrate how they can be used as part of a rotation and, and 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 how they can actually work on a day-to-day -day basis on a on a on a farm. So we've got cover crops to improve water quality, uh, and, and then improving that early crop biomass um, for for late sown crops to reduce nutrient losses over winter. Um, in Scotland, we were looking at different um, ways of um, adjusting crop nutrition through the season uh, using uh, assessments of bricks. Uh, and, and, and modifications of that standard farm practice based on Scottish technical notes. And then in the West, looking at the effects of cultivations on soil quality and soil health, uh, rooting and, and the cost of the production. And of course, that's going to follow through and have you know significant impact on the, the efficiency of fertilizer use. Um, and the effect of summer catch crops as well on, on then the preceding soil nitrogen supply. So really, really interesting work and, and demonstrates very clearly how you can use that on your own farm. Next slide, please, Michelle. One of the, the cornerstones of our knowledge exchange um, work over the last couple of years has been development of the Soil Health Scorecard. Um, and, and so um, 
you know, three or four years ago, it would have been really hard to describe to you exactly where uh, of what targets you should be looking to achieve for, for different soil characteristics. We've had pretty good um, um, thresholds for um, um, phosphate, for example, or potash, but when it came to soil organic matter and, and, and other measurements, other characteristics of soil, it was really unclear what we should be aiming to achieve. And so over the last five years, we've trialled uh, this scorecard approach on around 150 different fields across a whole range of different production systems. And this is just an example of that scorecard from a um, strategic farm. Um, and we've adopted in the way that we present this a traffic light system uh, it, it it works very well i think it's very intuitive different commercial companies will use this information in the science that we've developed with our partners um, uh, adas and niav in, in particular but um it's not always presented as a as a traffic light system but i i you know i think for us it works very well in this way um and you can quite clearly look at this scorecard and you can get a feeling for what's good perhaps where you might want to um pardon the pun dig it a little deeper or perhaps where you know there are some problems and you know i think it's very obvious here that um the visual evaluation of soil structure the vest score is suggesting that there there may be uh, an issue with soil structure in in two parts of this field uh, and then that's supported by earthworm counts as well. So you have a, at a glance a really neat way of looking at soil health, not just at the, the chemical or nutrient status of the soil, but also uh, the soil structure, the physical soil structure uh, and the biology that we're, we're nurturing within it as well. And, and that's been the cornerstone, as I say, of the knowledge exchange program and, and has underpinned the work that we've been doing on crop nutrition, because of course, without good soil, good soil health, um, you won't get very good use of, of fertilizer. Next slide, please, Michelle. So in terms of research, the research that we do on crop nutrition, um, largely guided by um, fertilizer response trials, nutrient response experiments on various crops, as I said, wheat, barley, and oats has been the focus over the last couple of years. Um, that information forms the revisions of RB209 we first published um, AHDB's uh, edition of RB209 in 2017, and we've updated it every year since. Um, so, so that you, um, as as levy pairs, as as our our farming customers, have the best, the most up to date guidance on on that fertilizer recommendation. It is just a guide, um, uh, but it is a fantastic guide, um, given that we make those recommendations for people farming in Cornwall or, or Northumberland. Um, but it, and, and gives you reassurance that that you're using, you know, in the ballpark, the right amount of fertilizer, and, and are able to work with your 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 advisor, or or if you're fast qualified yourself, be able to tweak those locally. But AHDB, you know, provide that overall national guidance, which is which is I think very useful. Um, as I say, we run those trials up and down the country. Um, we run them is in England and in Scotland also. Uh, in Scotland, we don't publish the technical notes, but that data is available to SRUC, um, and, and SRUC are, are quite often doing that work for us as well. So um, we're very much catering for, for farms in Scotland as well. Um, and then over the last couple of years, we've tried to improve guidance around soil structure and building soil organic matter and the effect that that can have uh, and does have on, on fertilizer use and fertilizer efficiency as well. Um, we also have a wealth of information, particularly on grass as well, and I encourage if you have grass on the farm, um, perhaps if you're a livestock farmer um, in the main, then, then please have a look at what we have to offer on grass at ahgb.org.uk forward slash grass have a lot of information uh, uh, um, around grass growth um, and and how to optimize use of nutrients next slide please Michelle. so just finally um, if all of the information that i've talked about um, here today you can find on the ahdb website and then in particular ahdb.org.uk forward slash the environment you'll find links to rb209 and all of our information on soils as well thank you very much Brilliant, thank you, James. Um, in particular, I can vouch for the scorecard. We use them on all the, the Monitor Farm and Strategic Farm Network um, across the UK, and they've been such a brilliant tool for us to demonstrate where, where the farmers are at. But the, doing the scorecard itself is just one step of the journey, kind of digging down the, to the story behind those figures. That's where it gets really interesting, really interesting and really useful.
Um, so thank you very much, James. And I'll segue straight over to, to our next um, speaker today, Pete Berry. Uh, Pete's um, joining us. Um, from, Pete's from the, the ADAS team. They've been working on the um, understanding your own economic optimum for when you're applying um, nitrogen. And they've really been kind of reacting to the recent fertilizer prices and making these updates for us with, with their reports. Uh, Pete, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll leave you to it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Richard. And good afternoon, everybody. Next, please. So the purpose of, of my few slides is twofold, really. Firstly, to quantify the impact of high fertilizer prices on how much nitrogen we should be applying and the economic optimum end rate. And secondly, to look at ways of mitigating the negative impacts of the high fertilizer prices. Next, please. So to begin with, uh, and next, we need to look at the fundamentals of um, economic optimum end rate. And economic optimum end rate is defined as the end rate at which the cost of applying one extra kilogram of nitrogen gives less value in terms of extra yield. Next, please. The AHDB Nutrient Management Guide, which James described, uh, formerly RB209, and for brevity, I'm going to refer to it as RB209 uh, throughout, uh, is its recommendations are based on a fertilizer cost to grain price ratio or break even ratio of five to one for cereals and two and a half to one for all C rates. So that means you need to produce five kilograms of grain to pay for each one kilogram of nitrogen for cereals or two and a half kilograms of seed to pay for one kilogram of nitrogen for all seed rape. And historically, uh, it's always been five to one and that's been pretty, pretty close really over the last several years. Um, but now uh, it's looking at uh, a break even ratio of closer to 10 to one if you bought at, in the autumn at the high fertilizer prices around 700 pounds a tonne of ammonium nitrate uh, and based on a wheat price of 200 pounds a tonne. So it's doubled. And uh, next, please, if you look at the all rape, then, you know, similarly, we're looking at a break even ratio moving up from two and a half to one to four to one uh, based on current prices. Next, please. So what's the impact of that on the economic optimum? Well, the bigger the break even ratio, the smaller the economic optimum and you basically move to the left of those nitrogen response curves from the closed diamond symbol where the old economic optimum would be down to the open circle where the new economic optimum would be based on current prices next please so what's the impact i mean if you have bought at the higher prices and the break-even ratio is 10 to 1 for cereals and you need to work out the break-even ratio for your own crops and fields, of course, but if it was about 10 to 1, then the result of that is that the RB209 recommended rate should be reduced by about 50 kilograms of N per hectare for cereals. And that's covering wheat, barley um, and oats. And for all seed rape, the break-even ratio of a four to one means that the current recommended rate given by RB209 should be, again, reduced by about 50 kilograms of N per hectare. So what's the impact of that on yield? That's an important thing, particularly if you've sold uh, forward. It's probably not as much as you might think in that uh, when we look at all our nitrogen response curves over the last few years, then on average, reducing the RB209 rate by 50 kilograms of N per hectare would reduce the cereal yield by about 0.35 tonnes per hectare. But it could be up to 0.6 tonnes per hectare in the sort of worst case scenario. And for all seed rape, the reduction would be about 0.15 tonnes per hectare and up to 0.25 tonnes per hectare. Next, please. Now, all of that is if you've got a break even ratio of uh, 10 to 1 for cereals or four to one for all seed rape. And of course, it will be different for everybody. Everybody will have a, their own break even ratio. So it's important to work it out for your own crop. And just remember when you're working it out, the, the price of the nitrogen is per kilogram of nitrogen, not per kilogram of product. So you need to convert the percentage of nitrogen in the product 
um, to account for that. Um, in the graph there, you can see on the x-axis to horizontal axis, the break-even ratio, and there's a big range there, up to 12 to 1, and the impact that that would have for all seeds or cereals on how you might need to change the RB209 recommended rate. So you can see there, it's just illustrative that if you're growing cereals and you've got a break-even ratio of 10 to 1, then you need to reduce the RB209 rate by about 50 kilograms of N per hectare. If it's greater, say if it's up to 12 to 1, then it's more like about 70 kilogram and per hectare reduction. And as a rule of thumb, for every increase in break-even ratio, every unit increase, you'd need to reduce the RB209 recommended rate by about 10 kilograms of N per hectare for cereals. Next, please. It's important to think about what the impact on yields will be, and this sort of gives a full summary of that. And these are based on the average response curves of probably wheat. We've probably had about 30 different response curves over the last um, several years. And you can see there that, again, as I said, the 50 kilogram reduction from RB2 and I'm recommendation, you're looking at a yield reduction of about 0.36 tonnes per hectare. And that's increasing to about a tonne per hectare reduction in yield if you're reducing the rate by 100 kilograms of N per hectare. For all seed rape, if you're reducing by 50, as I say, it's about 0.16 tonnes per hectare reduction in yield, moving up to about 0.43 tonnes per hectare for a reduction in 100 kilograms of N per hectare. And you're probably thinking, that's not as much as I expected, really. You know, I expected a bigger loss than that. Um, but the reason for that is that if you look on the graph there, we're operating around the flat bit of the nitrogen response curve. So you can have quite big changes in nitrogen rate around that optimum, which have quite a modest effect on the overall yield. Next, please. And next. So we've recently carried out a, a review for AHDB about the impact of the high nitrogen fertilizer prices and that can be found on the AHDB website uh, and in that report there are tables such as this uh, which uh, help you to work out what your break-even ratio is and how much you should reduce the RB209 rate by depending on your price of the fertilizer and what the price of grain you're selling at is. So next please. So you can sort of move along the top part of that table and see where uh, you sit in terms of fertilizer prices, depending on the product you've bought. Uh, and you can move along the left-hand side and look at what grain price you're likely to sell at, and then work out what uh, end rate you need to reduce by. Next, please. And similarly for all seed rape, and next. You can do exactly the same thing and you can find out where you sit in that matrix of numbers to figure out just how much you've got to reduce end rate by. Next, please. And then a, a, probably a much easier way is to use the AHDB calculator, which Mark is going to describe in, in much more detail in a minute. And there you can just input information about fertilizer price and grain price uh, and, and come out with the numbers. But I won't steal Mark's funder, I'll let him describe that in detail in a moment. So, next, please. So historically, we've, we've given the message that um, as long as you, you're within plus or minus 50, about 50 kilograms of N per hectare around the economic optimum, then there isn't going to be much of a, a loss of profit if you're within that range. You know, it's not a precise science that's getting it, it, the optimum N rate exactly right. So as long as you're within plus or minus 50 kilograms, uh, you're not going to lose much profit. However, in the current climate, uh, that's not quite true because we're now moving to the left on that response curve from the blue triangle to the green triangle, and you're on a steeper part of the curve. So it means that if you're wrong, then there's potentially a bigger penalty in terms of yield loss. So there is a bigger sort of um, cost now to getting it wrong. And it's even more important to try as hard as possible to estimate the optimum end rate as accurately as possible. Now, we've estimated that uh, if you were to, if you've bought at high nitrogen prices 
uh, but you carry on as normal and you, and you sort of put the normal end rate on and let's say normal end rate is 200 kilograms of end per hectare but really the you should be putting on 150 then the result of putting on 200 uh, would be a loss of profit of around 30 pounds per hectare next please and we also worked out the impact of the current prices on the gross margin over the nitrogen costs. So the old prices are in blue there, that's last year. Um, and we've worked this out on the new prices based on autumn fertilizer prices. And you can see that you know you'd be losing using less nitrogen fertilizer, that 50 kilograms less in this case. Um, You'll be getting a bit less yield, but that's more than compensated for by the greater crop prices this year compared to last year. So the actual gross margin over nitrogen costs are a bit more than last year. So uh, thanks to high grain prices and long may they continue. Next, please. So that's part one of what our report. Um, we're going to do a part two of this report in January, which is going to consider uh, the impact of high prices on milling wheat and barley, uh, malting barley management, uh, which split to prioritise. And you know, at the moment, we're thinking the first split is the most important one to prioritise. Uh, which fields to prioritise? And we're thinking the ones with the lowest soil nitrogen supply, most important. Um, the value of uh, products which improve nitrogen efficiency. The long-term impacts, you know, if these prices last for more than a year, what are the long-term impacts in terms of residual nitrogen and following crops? So those sorts of things are going to be considered in the next report. And in addition to this, um, AHDB have also given us some funding to review the impact of nitrogen prices on grassland and optimum uh, end rates for grass. Next, please. So I'm now going to move on to thinking about how can we mitigate the negative impacts of these high fertilizer prices? Next, please. Uh, and there's a number of areas that uh, we can look at. We can look at reducing the demand for nitrogen in the whole system, uh, for example, by growing crops with a lower end requirement. We'll look at that in a minute in the next slide. Uh, reducing losses from the system, such as by using cover crops to mop up nitrogen in the autumn to minimize leaching and using fertilizer uh, products which are more efficient. Next, please. And then we can look at ways of just getting a, a, as accurate an estimate of the optimum end rate as possible by various means, such as ju making judgments about past successes and failures, uh, analyzing the grain nutrients, experimentation on farm. Next, please. And adjusting appropriately for the cost of end, which we've just described, and monitoring crops uh, throughout the season to avoid deficiency or over applying. Next, please. So firstly, how can we reduce the overall requirement for nitrogen? Well, this chart here summarizes an experiment we did where we compared the nitrogen response of different uh, cereal species. So in red you've got wheat and in the red triangle you've got the economic optimum of this particular wheat crop. In orange you've got barley, winter barley, in green you've got oats, in blue there's triticale. And you can see that you know, especially triticale um, you can get uh, a good yield with less nitrogen um, from some of the other cereal species compared to wheat. So there's opportunities around to use different crops uh, which have a lower end requirement and if we're thinking about also rape as well then we might consider other break crops such as pulses interspersed with also rape so um, mixing those break crops up next please and then if we think just about uh, wheat and triticale crop types then we, we interestingly we find that uh, Wheat types which have a, a low inherent protein concentration in the grain have a lower economic optimum end rate. So those um, blobs in green there, those are uh, varieties of wheat and triticale actually, one of those is triticale, which have a lower 
grain protein concentration. And some of them come from Denmark. There are varieties like Maribos, uh, the Herefords in there. Uh, and we found that there's really quite consistently, really, that um, the varieties with a low protein concentration just don't need as much nitrogen to achieve their potential yield, simply because they've got a lower nitrogen requirement. So there's the scope there to minimize the nitrogen requirement as well. And then in other species, uh, the breeders we know are producing varieties with low end traits, such as lima grains, N flex, sweeter varieties, but also grape. So, the next thing to consider is well, how to decide how much to buy and then apply. Of course, it's an economic decision, as we've just described, uh, of course, keeping in, in line with NVZ compliance. And the AHDB Nutrient Management Guide, which James described, formerly RB209, when we've tested it, it works well on average across you know, a wide range of farms and fields. But there is a lot of variation within that. You know, and you do find that there are fields and farms which deviate from um, what RB209 would recommend. So it's really important to use uh, farm experience to uh, fine tune what RB209 recommends. Next, please. So just looking at the, the fundamentals, you know, we start with crop demand to estimate what the nitrogen requirements are of a crop. How much N does my crop need? And that's really determined by its expected yield and the concentration of nitrogen in the grain. Next, please. And then we've got to think, well, how much of that nitrogen can be supplied naturally by the soil? Next. And then the gap really is uh, what's got to be met by fertilizer and manures. Next, please. So we can simplify the equation for the amount of fertilizer our crop requires in terms of demand that the crop has in kilograms of nitrogen per hectare minus the soil nitrogen supply, all divided by the fertilizer recovery percentage. And that fertilizer recovery percentage can vary a lot, I must confess, it averages about 60%, but it could be as little as 30%, it could be as much as 80%. There's lots of scope for improvement there. Next, please. So deciding what end rate is right for your farm is, is really a strategic decision, and, and a lot of experience does undoubtedly come into it, looking at past yields, looking at uh, you know where lodging has occurred, looking at the impacts of fertilizer misses or overlaps on the state of a crop, uh, doing your own calculations of nitrogen offtake and uh, nitrogen use efficiency metrics. It's important to estimate as well as you can the soil mineral N, as well as how much extra N might become mineralized during the season. And organic matter levels are quite a good way of estimating the mineralization levels, but there are lab methods also of estimating the potentially available N from mineralization. It's so important to estimate how much nitrogen will be available from manures, of course. Um, and also, as you'll see in a minute in more detail, analyzing the grain nutrients is a very good way of testing whether the crop uh, had sufficient nutrients or not. So, for example, for nitrogen and for feed weeds, if they've got a grain protein concentration of 11%, then that tells you that they've been pretty close to ideal nitrogen fertilization. If it's down at 9 or 10% protein, then you know it hasn't had enough N. If it's up at 12, 13, you know it's had too much N. For milling wheats, uh, it's about 12%. That tells you that you've, you've fertilized it perfectly for optimum yield. Obviously, you need a bit more nitrogen to get the uh, protein spec of 13, but 12% tells you it's been fertilized right for its yield. And then, of course, testing uh, end rates on farm and what we recommend is doing tram lines with 50 kilograms of n per hectare more or 50 kilograms per hectare less on alternate tram lines to test that. Next please. So as I said the uh, analysis of the grain for its nutrient concentration is a really useful way to tell whether or not the crop had sufficient of those nutrients and, it, and it's uh, been shown to work for a, a wide range of nutrients, uh, can be particularly useful for phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, 
And I should emphasize that it's really important to get, make sure these other nutrients are in sufficient supply because the nitrogen sufficiency will be impaired significantly if the other nutrients are in short supply. So it's really important to make sure you've got the P indices right and the K indices right uh, and sufficient sulfur applied especially. Um, and you can use that this analysis um, to really work out which nutrients might have been lacking uh, for your crop. And there's a number of labs which carry out grain nutrient analysis and ADAS also produce uh, a service called Yen Nutrition uh, where you submit a grain sample and we provide a report which summarizes the nutrient offtakes in your crop and which nutrients your crop may have been limited for. Next slide, please. Online trials and testing uh, new products, new rates is really important. There's, there's no substitute for it, and all farms and fields are a bit different, aren't they? So it's it's vital really to, to get into a culture of testing ideas on your own fields, I think. And a few years ago, we, we carried out a project for AHDB called the Learn Project, which tested the value of uh, comparing treatments on farm. And we tested very simple tests, uh, tram lines with 60 kilograms of N per hectare less or 60 kilograms per hectare more to help farmers work out whether they were undersupplying or oversupplying their fields for nitrogen. And it worked really well. Next slide, please. And we use, uh, if you go back one, please, um, our guide called the Agronomics Guide, which is on the ADAS website and you can pick up this and it gives you some guidance about carrying out tramline trials uh, and we can use the yield map and the raw yield data from the yield map to statistically analyze whether the yield on the different tramlines was statistically different. So it gives you confidence that any differences in yield between the tramlines were actually caused by that treatment. It's very easy to mislead yourself with some tramline trials because of the underlying variation in the soil. But uh, this approach should give you confidence uh, about the results of those sorts of tramline tests. Next, please. And then we move on to sensing and testing within the season. There's lots of sensors out there um, which are all you know, very useful. The challenge really is to how to integrate these into the decision making. Um, early in the spring, the crop is a very good indicator of the amount of available soil and particularly for crops which take up a lot of autumn ends such as oilseed rape. And it's worth mentioning that some of the big oilseed rape canopies at the moment probably are worth about 300 pounds per hectare just in terms of their end content alone. So it's going to be important to make the best use of that as you'll see in a moment. Um, later on, using sensors to check the nitrogen status uh, will be very helpful. And just simple visual checks, you know, can be very useful, especially if you've got some treatments in the field which are lower or higher end hits. Next, please. So it's important to measure how much nitrogen there is in the crop uh, at the moment and in the spring, uh, particularly for all seed rape. Typically, uh, a single unit of green area index of all seed rate will contain 50 kilograms of N per hectare. And really, this con contributes to the nitrogen supply of a crop. So if you've got a crop with a very large canopy, lots of N in it, then that's going to reduce the amount of nitrogen that's needed to be applied to that crop. Um, even if you've got a large all seed rate canopy now, and then we encounter a very cold winter and it gets frosted off, that nitrogen that's in the canopy now still counts towards the um, nitrogen that the crop will take up uh, in the spring and the summer. So it can be uh, it can be used to reduce the amount of fertilizer applied in the spring. And that's because the leaves that drop off, uh, the nitrogen in them will mineralize and it will get taken back up into the crop in time um, before harvest. It doesn't work if the pigeons have eaten your canopy off though and the uh, and the nitrogen is being deposited somewhere else. Next, please. So how to estimate the green area index and the nitrogen uptake? Well, you can use um, a couple of phone apps that use digital photos 
of the crop uh, to estimate the green area index and the nitrogen content. They work up to the green area index at about two and a half. Anything bigger, and you've really got to do some hard yards, I'm afraid, and uh, sample the crop. And, and what we recommend is sampling at a metre squared of crop, cut it off at ground level, weigh the fresh weight in kilograms, and then multiply the number of kilograms by 0.8 to give you the green area index. And remember, the green area index, um, each unit of green area index contains 50 kilograms of M per hectare. Next, please. And then a, a simple rule of thumb, really, is just to look at the ground cover. If you've got a third of a ground covered, then you've got a green air index of about half, and you've got about 25 kilos of N in the crop. If you've got uh, a ground cover of about half, you've got a green air index of one and 50 kilograms of N in the crop. Three quarters, and you've got about 100 kilograms of N in the crop. Next, please. And then there are various... Uh, either satellite or tractor mounted sensors which can be used to estimate the nitrogen in the crop which uh, which work well. Next please. So there's a few crops like this at the moment. We've had a, a pretty good established for, for most uh, and a really open autumn which has enabled lots of nitrogen uptake for many crops. Next please. And uh, you know, I wanted to bring this up really because it, it introduces some interesting questions. If you've got a crop like this with a green air index of 2.8, so that's going to contain about 140 kilograms of N per hectare in the canopy itself. Let's say it's sucked out most of the mineral N in the soil and only a small amount, 10 kilos in the soil. Now, if we didn't fertilize this crop at all, it would take up about 150 kilograms of N per hectare in total. And Bear in mind that the target total end uptake for all seed rate for the optimum size canopy by flowering is about 175 kilograms of N per hectare. So it's only 25 kilos short of what we want it to take up in the end. So um, it's quite close. Um, we also increase the amount of N to all seed rate by 30 kilograms for every extra half a tonne we think it's going to get above three and a half tonnes per hectare. So let's say this crop is targeted to get four tonnes per hectare, then in total, uh, in order to achieve the optimum canopy size at flowering and to achieve a bit extra for yield, we'd be applying about 70 kilograms of N per hectare to this crop. It doesn't sound like very much, does it? But think also that if, um, if you bought at the high fertiliser prices, then you'd want to reduce that by 50 kilograms of N per hectare, leaving you with just a a recommended rate of 20. So it doesn't sound like very much at all, does it? But that's the sort of um, calculations we're probably into at the moment. And when we've grown crops like this without any nitrogen, they do yield. You know, we've got three tons plus uh, per hectare from these sorts of crops. I mean, they'd look rather scruffy, I must admit, uh, during early stem extension. They don't look great. Um, and it does take a brave person not to recommend any fertilizer to these really big crops. So you probably want to put a bit on and you'll need to make sure it's got sufficient sulfur as well and not be limited in that respect. Um, but, you know, uh, we need to sort of take full account of the nitrogen in these large canopies. Next, please. And then we've got uh, different N efficiency products. We've got nitrification inhibitors, urease inhibitors, a combination of both slow and control release products. These uh, inefficient products become more valuable uh, in the current situation where we're operating at a lower optimum end rate. So we're closer to the shoulder, the steep part of the end response curve. So these sorts of products will have greater value in this sort of situation. And particularly the urease inhibitors, if you're using urea or UAN, we've seen some good uh, yield improvements by using these products. Next, please. And finally, I think it's important to think about carefully about the return on end, particularly the last few kilograms of nitrogen that are applied. I mean, there's no question that the first 100 or so kilograms of N per hectare gives you a great yield response generally, two to four tons per hectare for cereals. But the last few kilograms of N per hectare uh, it's more of a marginal return. And we've done some calculations for this for the last few kilograms of N per hectare and what the return is. 
based on the nitrogen prices and grain prices of last year. So the last 10 kilograms of N per hectare applied in the first row of that table uh, would give you a yield increase of 0.06 tonnes per hectare. It cost you about seven pounds per hectare. So it gives you an increased margin of about 70p a hectare. The, the final 20 kilograms of N per hectare gives you an increased margin of about three pounds per hectare. So you can see it's, it's quite marginal. Um, we just need to sort of think carefully about uh, what we're getting back for those last few kilograms of N. Next, please. So in, in conclusion, um, you know, if bought at high prices and you've got a high break-even ratio, then it's important not to be afraid to cut end rates back. Yield reductions might not be as big as, as you might perceive. It's important to use uh, all the tools available to assess whether past nitrogen rates were right, looking at the grain analysis, uh, using the Yen Nutrition Service, experiments on farm with uh, different tram line for different rates of N. Uh, it's important to track the N status with sensors during the season uh, and just looking at visual comparisons is a help. Uh, mm. And also not mentioned here but it's very important, it's important to make sure the other nutrient levels are right, particularly P and K and sulphur. If they are right then nitrogen sufficiency will be impaired. And finally, you know, the pressure from high fertilizer prices requires exactly the same solutions as responding to high carbon. Thank you very much for listening and uh, I look forward to any questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, just what, one more before we go into Mark. It's going to come up a few times on the, the chat here. Is, is there any, any evidence to suggest that the, the type of farming system has a, an impact on the nitrogen dose response curve? So kind of if you're plow base, min till, um, direct drilling. Is there any is there any kind of evidence behind that? Well, certainly, if you're not disturbing the soil very much, then there will be less mineralization. And if I'm remembering correctly, that the sort of figures that you get, you get about an extra 15 kilograms of N per hectare of mineralization if you're disturbing the soil compared with just direct drilling. So there is there is a an impact of that. Uh, yes. Brilliant. And can, can you improve the nitrogen use efficiency from more frequent N applications? Well, we are looking at that at the moment. Um, it's potentially, yes, it's the, the sort of results we've had so far are mixed. Some experiments show, you know, more frequent splits has no effects. Some have shown a slight improvement uh, in the nitrogen uptake efficiency. So potentially, yes, but it's, it's not a clear picture yet. Brilliant. Thank you, Pete. And we'll be coming back to you a bit, bit later. Thank you very much. That was, that was yeah, brilliant. Um, now we're going to move over to, to Mark Topliff. Like I mentioned earlier, Mark works in um, our farm economics team and he's a senior analyst there. And he really kind of drills down into all the data and information that HDB has um, around kind of real life UK farming systems. And Mark's really going to be looking at the association here between the, the amount of um, nitrogen used and the, the yield and the profitability of the crop. Um, so, Mark, thank you very much. And I'll, and I'll pass the baton to you. Cheers. Thanks, Richard, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate that uh, in the current situation, it, it can pay to cut inorganic nitrogen fertilizer usage. And we're going to use the results that we've had from our farm bench users, um, and we'll look at the impact of the current prices, the relationship between nitrogen applied and yield, uh, and look at what the top 25% performer figures look like as well. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate the nitrogen adjustment calculator and with current prices show that it can, can pay to reduce the application rate. Uh, first slide, please. So just to set the scene, and I'm sure these trends are very familiar and, and relevant to you all. Uh, we've, we've seen you know, a tremendous increase in the, the fertilizer price very recently, of course. We've got uh, a survey which is conducted monthly uh, for fertilizer prices, which you can find on our website. And uh, what we've seen, for example, these two uh, particular price trends is that uh, ammonium nitrate for imported has gone up 183% uh, in the last 12 months. And for uh, DAP, that's gone up just over 100%. So uh, you know, more than doubled, basically, uh, in the last 12 months. So uh, they're they significant. So, so what's, what's the impact of that then in terms of our uh, sort of fertilizer cost? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next build, please. <clears throat> 
And, and so what we're going to do is look at uh, a range of barley and wheat crops and look at uh, what that fertilizer cost has looked like for this last harvest year, so the 2021 harvest year. Uh, and then what I'll do is, is use that as a baseline to see, well, if you didn't change your fertilizer quantities, what would be the cost for your crop that you're going to harvest next year if you bought the fertilizer in summer or if you bought the fertilizer this autumn? Next spill, please. So this, this first load of figures are showing what the our provisional figures from FarmBench show for fertilizer costs for those crops. Uh, this, is, this is just inorganic fertilizer cost pound per hectare. And um, so they're around about 125 to about 100, 200 pounds per hectare, depending on what crop it is. Um, next bill, please. But if we apply that, um, the, sort of, you know, the price of summer bought fertilizer to that baseline, then we're looking like for those crops for this 2022 harvest year, increasing by about 60 to 100 pounds per hectare if you don't change your application rate. Next bill, please. And that will increase significantly more if we base it on the prices that we're seeing currently. Uh, and we're looking at up to £270 per hectare higher inorganic fertilisers costs for this next season. So it just highlights the, the sort of crucial nature of looking at, uh, at nitrogen fertiliser and fertilisers as a whole at the moment in terms of trying to see if we can reduce that cost and mitigate some of the higher costs and prices that we're seeing at the moment, even though we are seeing better uh, uh, grain prices. Next slide, please. I thought I'd just pull out of farm bench uh, figures. Um, the, the sort of range that we see in the inorganic nitrogen as applied uh, versus the yield. And here I've, I've, I've honed it down, right down to looking at first winter feed week results on clay loam soils. So look at as similar situation as we can. And, and we've got four years worth of results being represented here. Uh, and this may be a surprise to you or not, but we, we see a very scattered picture here. So each of these individual dots is an individual crop result. Uh, and you can see that they're all scattered. Uh, so there's no clear relationship. They're not tightly sort of together in a, in a nice sort of trend line in any way. And if you look at, say, the 200 um, line there, uh, the inorganic applied 200 kilos and applied per hectare line, you can see the range that's been reported in terms of yield is, is between at the top end 11 tonnes per hectare down to nearly sort of five tonnes per hectare. So a huge range there. And, and even uh, looking at those other application rates that people have reported, there's still quite a significant range. So there's, there's many factors in that involved in that, of course, and Pete sort of covered some of that. Uh, and it's, it's more complicated than, than what it first looks like. Uh, but what's, what you what to get out of this, it, there's probably scope for, for many growers to look at reducing the application uh, and, and maybe not affect their yield by much or, or, or if at all. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at what the top 25% do. And what I've done is separated that, that same group of data we've just seen in that previous chart and looked at the top 25% and the bottom 25% based on their net margin performance. So firstly, let's look at yield. You can see that top 25% have got a high yield by nearly one and a half tonnes per hectare. Um, the amount of organic, inorganic N that they apply is, is a handful of kilos more in that top 25%. But when you sort of look at that, if you, if you take that sort of N applied, uh, you know, and divide the yield into that, the sort of ratio of, of of that uh, then is much lower in that top 25%. So they they applied in that top 25% 21 kilos of nitrogen per hectare for every tonne of of yield that they've got, uh, and that's um, three kilos less than what the bottom 25% have done. So they, they they are using that that supply of fertilizer probably more efficiently, and they say there's several reasons possibly behind that. But uh, one of the reasons may well be, if you put on the next bill, please, um, we, if we look at the fertilizer cost, this is looking at the total fertilizer cost. So this is including the inorganic, the organic fertilizer and trace elements as well. For the top 25%, they do have overall um, slightly lower fertilizer cost per hectare as well. So £185 per hectare. And if you break that down in terms of where that cost comes from, 
most of that is from inorganic fertilizer so for the top 25 percent 90 percent of that cost is from inorganic fertilizer versus 95 percent in the bottom 25 percent and you can see the difference here it is really in the you know the organic fertilizer that's being used um there's you know uh, eight um, percent is, is of that cost is down to organic fertilizer so that's five percentage points higher than the bottom 25 percent uh, they also tend to use uh, higher trace elements as well but uh, that's probably a discussion from another day next slide please so um, based on that then um, James has already mentioned about the nutrient management guide and Peter as well in terms of what's been done around that um, and there's been a lot of work recently to update that um, by RADAS and what we've done to, is now to sort of take that forward so from the tables which are presented in that guide and, and in the recent report from ADAS uh, we've now built a calculator next slide please so we've created this nitrogen fertilizer adjustment calculator which you can find if you go into the main HDB website if you look at tools at the top of the page on the main site uh, and then scroll down to the, the, the nitrogen fertilizer adjustment calculator icon on that next page uh, you'll then come to this uh, next uh, calculator which is downloadable it's just in a simple sort of spreadsheet this is just an introduction page just to introduce what the calculator is about um, but what I'll just show you in the next slide is uh, if we move on please what we're able to do in this calculator is take what you can do in those tables in RB209 so taking the fertilizer price the, the amount of fertilizer uh, and nitrogen content of those fertilizers and the expected grain price and work out a, a tailored result of what can you reduce your application by uh, and what the impact that might be on your yield, uh, the income and the cost of the fertilizer as well. And so this calculator is set up so you can actually look at three different cereal crops side by side or three different oil seed crops side by side, or you could look at three different scenarios or three different uh, fertilizer types, for example, side by side. Next slide, please. So let's just demonstrate how to use it. It's so straightforward. Uh, let's just concentrate on looking at a cereal example. So firstly, you can put in your fertilizer price. Um, so here we'll just put in £700. Next bill, please. And then if you add in the nitrogen content of the fertilizer you're using and expected grain price, so you can see put in, put in those three figures, it calculates automatically your cost of fertilizer. So Peter was sort of look, saying about uh, calculating your your cost of nitrogen per kilo and so this does that and so this comes out at about two pounds per kilo and also your break-even ratio which is crucial at uh, looking at your economic optimum so in this case 8.8 uh, kilos of grain are needed to be uh, sold to pay for your fertilizer and so then we've got the recommended application reduction then underneath that from those three figures so in this case reducing it by 40 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. Um, next bill, please. And what we've done using those tables and those charts that uh, we've just seen from Pete, we've, we've you can estimate you know, what's the effect on the yield there. So in this case, you know, um, and this matches what was just been seen that it's not a huge effect by just reducing your application by 40 kilos, 50 kilos. You know, you talk about 0.3 tons per hectare. Um, but it's what we're showing here then is what's the economic impact of that and in terms of crop income in this case it's it's reducing your income by 61 pounds per hectare but it's also reducing your fertilizer your nitrogen fertilizer cost by 81 pounds per hectare so it, it in this case in this scenario with these figures it pays to reduce the application rate so uh, i'd encourage you to come into this sort of calculator and do your own scenarios do your own situation and see what that looks like what we can also do we've just added in a couple of extra um, figures here so if you add in uh, next bill please uh, your sort of typical or, or what your recommended nitrogen rate is uh, next bill please the uh, and the area planted uh, up at the top there what you can then get uh, underneath is then just what what's that help what does that sort of help you sort of look at what's your nitrogen application rate would be so taking that typical rate that you'd normally do your recommended rate taking off your decreased 
uh, recommended application so you can see what that is on a per hectare basis but also it gives you a, a total amount of fertilizer product that, that then you would require for that area that you're going to plant as well so it's just giving you some figures which hopefully will help in your decision making uh, and you can play around with those figures to look at different scenarios as i say and, and different crops as necessary so next slide please so just finally just to end on we've got various links here which uh, tie into some of those things which have been mentioned already and uh, hopefully these things will help with your decision making uh, i put in there at the bottom as the the farm bench link as well so this is where you can look at your own cost production it's a, a web-based tool um, relatively simple tool to, uh, for growers to put in their figures and i think in these times where we've got increasing input prices high input prices um, and it's uncertain about you know, when we might see some of those prices come back down again. And so the impact of the cost, it, I think it's very worthwhile looking at your cost production for your different crop enterprises and just seeing what the impact might be and do some budgeting around that. So, so that tool is available to anybody and is free to use. So that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. And I'm going to take us straight into to Helen Plant now. Um, I can see we've got plenty of questions coming in. So we're we're going to have a lot of discussion at the end of this. Um, so why are we all here today discussing this? So that's because the, the fertilizer prices are high at the moment. And Helen's going to do a bit of um, analysis to, to help us understand why that is and what the kind of the futures look like um, for us with her, with, her, um, with her crystal ball. Thank you, Helen, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, sounds working now. There we go. Um, so yeah, so as we've heard a lot today about how prices are and for fertiliser, I'm focusing particularly on nitrogen fertilisers here today. Um, and then the other side of the equation, it's all about the, the trade-off between the grain or oilseed and fertiliser price. So I want to do a bit on both um, quickly in the next few minutes just to give you a flavour of what we're seeing so far looking into next year. We can move on to next slide, please. So starting with nitrogen fertilisers then, um, as Mark showed earlier, we've got the, the blue line here that's showing the UK imported ni ammonium nitrate price in AHDB survey. This is a survey that looks back um, over months that are concluded. And as we know, the, um, the prices continue to rise into November and up to around £700 per tonne at times. A lot of what was driving that sharp increase was a, a rise in European gas prices. And although they dipped off uh, last month, they're now back up to those peaks that we saw in October time um, as well. So that is just something to keep in mind. What I want to look at now is why those prices raised and what we can see as we look forward. Next slide, please. Uh, it really started with um, low European gas stocks and actually just before I look at this I should say the reason for that close correlation in the prices is that around uh, 60 to 80 percent of the variable costs involved in producing ammonium nitrate is from the gas that is the raw product in its production so it, it is that close correlation and so what happens with natural gas is going to be important for what happens when fertilizer prices, uh, nitrogen prices as we move forward. And it, it did start with low um, stocks that ran down in the sort of dark blue line there um, after last winter. And those stocks across Europe struggled to rebuild for various reasons. But what that's meant is we've come into this winter with relatively low stocks again. <coughs> And that's making the market very nervous and why we've seen such sharp rises in prices coming through. Um, we see a particular impact in the UK because around half of our natural gas requirements are imported, a uh, mixture from the continent and um, pipelines and other bits, but also coming in in the form of liquefied natural gas as well, imports from further afield. Um, and there's a couple of factors at the moment that have pushed things up in the last few days. And some of that is political tensions um, with the between 
particularly Germany and Russia coming through with the, a pipeline that was due to come on, um, be commissioned around this time, hasn't yet been so, and there are political reasons around that, and that's going on in the background as well. The sort of market view is that it's unlikely to disrupt supplies too much, but that tension in the background is is making them nervous. Arguably, one of the key things as we look forward then is about the supply and demand. And the key factor for demand for gas is going to be the weather. If we see a long, cold winter, so those stocks will run down much more quickly, um, putting further pressure on us to import more from further afield from outside of Europe and push up prices again. Um, the flip side of that, if we see a shorter, milder winter, um, we could see gas prices ease back off um, because we don't want to be carrying expensive big stocks of gas into the new, into the spring and into the summer. We want to have run the stocks down and then rebuild them when prices get lower. Um, but it's not just our winter. It's mentioned uh, the imports from further afield. It kind of also depends then what sort of winter they have in places like Japan and China because they also rely quite heavily on imports or not heavily, but they rely, they use quite substantial imports of liquefied natural gas as well, and we'd be competing for the same supplies. The, um, that, so at the moment, as we stand looking at the sort of weather forecast for Europe, it's not looking the most hopeful in that there are colder than normal temperatures predicted for the couple of months ahead. It, that's still early days. There's a lot of winter to happen, but at the moment it's not offering us um, too much optimism, shall I say, on that front. So if we go on now to look at grain prices, um, this is the other side of the equation, the other part of that break even point, the, the nitro foot versus the grain. And What's happened with old crop prices, which are in the the sort of orangey colour, they've shot up um, and that's pulled up new crop prices as well in the blue, which is what we're, we're focusing on here because of um, the prices for the crop that we're, we're growing with the high expensive uh, fertiliser. Two seconds. <clears throat> And those blue lines are definitely well above the 10 year ranges. And that's the 10 year range that includes 2012. Um, so we're starting from a good point. And arguably the, the rise in grain prices and oilseed prices has offset some of the rise in um, fertilizer prices. If we hadn't seen these particularly high prices coming through, we'd be looking at even steeper reductions in nitrogen applications to try and mitigate. So where do we go from here then with this? I'm gonna have the next slide please, Michelle. So we're starting with um, low global grain stocks. And this is the factor that pushed up um, prices throughout the sort of last crop marketing year and into the start of this crop marketing year prices for the 2021 crop. And um, although we don't have forecasts yet for next year, that low level of stocks is keeping markets nervous. We need good crops from in the 2022 to 23 year to replenish those stocks. Um, otherwise, we're going to be looking at problems and potential further rises in prices. Now, there's no reason at the moment to assume that we won't get those um, a recovery in production after the issues we had this year. So I'm particularly thinking here of the problems with the Canadian rapeseed crop and the US wheat crops and Canadian wheat crops as well. Um, at the moment, we have to assume that those were one-off events. And if we got that sort of supply recovery into the 2022-23 marketing season, we would be looking at pressure coming through on prices. So that's a risk to keep in the background. In the short term though, in the next sort of few months, and we move on to next slide here, we haven't quite finished um, the, 
uh, production in the 21-22 marketing year. And those low stock figures include forecasts for record crops in South America. Could we have next, could I have next slide, Michelle? Sorry, it's not popping up. Um, either way, the production in those areas, um, it's not yet concluded. So we've got soybean crops in Brazil and Argentina that are currently going through their critical yield forming periods. There we go, perfect. Um, and maize crops, the early maize crops are also in those critical yield forming periods. And um, the forecast for the remainder of this yield forming period and into harvest is for weather to be drier than usual in some of the key sort of growing areas shown with the dotted lines here. The, um, the, uh, the, the, sorry, two seconds. <coughs> um, that, so far, we've been seeing um, some timely rainfalls that although the, the probability of normal rainfall in total is below normal, that is keeping those crops in relatively good condition. So there's a lot of uncertainty about how those crops will play out. But for soybeans, um, and the region accounts for 50% of global soybean exports, will give us, um, will be known relatively soon. So we're going to know that by the end of sort of February time as to how that's going through. And unless we see a problem with these South American soybean crops, we're going to be looking at pressure on global oilseed prices and so on rapeseed prices too. For maize, it's a bit more complicated and we're still a bit more on the fence because although early crops are in their key yield forming period, the critical Brazilian safrina crop won't be planted until sort of February, March time after the soybeans are harvested. Um, so we've got a lot longer to go with how that unfolds and develops. And, um, but the bottom line is we haven't got a lot of room for error. Um, so the, although if the crops come up as forecast, we're likely to see pressure on prices. If we see problems in these areas, um, we're going to see support prices. So if we just move on to the last slide then. Um, so pulling it all together, there is a risk that high gas prices could keep um, nitrogen fertilizer prices high into the spring. Um, there is, but it very does depend on the weather and what comes forward. For anyone who's still got purchases to make, um, it's a difficult sort of situation there. On the flip side of that, and particularly if you bought at high prices, um, we do have a risk of the grain and oilseed prices softening um, from the current levels coming through into our spring. So it's important to, and I would play with Mark's calculator, the calculator Mark showed us, um, with a range of different grain and oilseed prices to see how it shifts your break-even ratio and your economic optimums. because that's going to be the key point, not just the current prices, but what happens if the grain price dropped by £20 per tonne, for argument's sake, or rose by £10 per tonne, 20. Just that awareness of where the economic optimum may change and shift. And the two final bits, just to leave you with, and some of this will be picked up in the January review of RB209 that uh, Pete mentioned earlier is around sort of the contract requirements and I'm particularly thinking here of malting barley and milling wheat crops as to how you were just there and being aware of what your contract requires when you've made sales and what is needed to meet those especially when you're adjusting nitrogen levels. Um, Pete also touched on about the forward sales and if you're adjusting nitrogen levels, what is your expected yield and expected production from the farm adjusting by? And then what percentage of that potentially lower crop do you then sell forward to avoid contract issues further down the line? But my takeaway would be that it's about the balance here between the cost of the fertilizer and the cost and what you can achieve for the crop and taking that forward into the grain marketing as you go on. Thank you.
think we're just Brilliant. about to time there, Richard. Yeah, bang on. It never happens with me. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. That's perfect. I'm just spot on. Um, if I could invite Pete, um, Mark and uh, James to, to join us back on the, the virtual stage. Um, I've got a few questions to, to get through. So um, hold on to your seats, Pete, Pete in particular. You've got a few. All right. Pete. With precision farming and yield monitoring, we've always faced the dilemma of whether we should apply more N to the poorer parts of the field to boost yield or to give them less because the N is so poor, less because the response to N is so poor. Does the higher nitrogen price make that an easier decision in this day? Yes, high nitrogen price makes it more worthwhile to variably apply the nitrogen within a field, certainly. and it's, it, it does depend on the field as to whether it's what the right approach is, whether you're better off putting more on the low SMN areas or or vice versa. But the work we've done, you know, the balance of the work we've done is indicating that you are better to, to put more on to the regions of the field which have got a lower soil nitrogen supply. That's that's the sort of first thing to get right. It's important also to say that uh, when you're thinking about variable rate N applications, by far the most important thing to get right first is the overall average N rate for the field. Because if your overall average N rate is, let's say, 200 kilograms of N per hectare, uh, and you're maybe varying your opt N rate around an average of, say, 250, it, it will not. Uh, provide a good sort of um, profitability. But the, the big focus has got to be getting on the, the average end rate for the whole field right and then start thinking about varying it spatially within the field. Thank you, Pete. Another one for you. And it's more of a comment to get your comment on. Using grain analysis for judging optimum fertilization is okay in a perfect world. If you include sunlight into Liebig's barrel concept in a year when sunlight is limiting, then the relationship is unrevealing. We assume that we're sufficiently competent to have eliminated any other limiting input. So, is judging nitrogen performance on on previous data potentially flawed? Do you think? Um, we, we, we tested it on quite a lot of crops, and it, it it did stack up okay for using grain nitrogen concentration as an indicator of of good or accurate. Um, optimum end rate. Um, yes, yeah, so the question is whether there's other sort of factors which will confound it. And I, I think there are, you know, if, if the if if the other nutrients such as P and K and sulfur particularly are wrong or inadequate, then it, that relationship will break down. So we are sort of making the assumption that nitrogen is the predominant limiting factor of the of the yield of the crop. And if there are other sort of predominant limiting factors such as other nutrients or you know or even sunlight then it is likely to um fall apart yeah brilliant thank you uh i think it's one for you james if if i was spread to spread poultry muck in a winter wheat crop this spring how much np and k can i expect the crop can take up and how much n will volatilize wow um I think you just muted yourself again. Sorry. Um, it, 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 it's, it's impossible to give it the, an exact answer on that. It depends on the, the, the crop. It depends on the amount of um, uh, material that you're going to apply. But um, you, you essentially, you, you can work that out using a uh, planner. You know, say so, so if you, you know, what crop are you growing? What's your soil type? What you know, what, what was the previous crop? That will give you your recommendation. That will give you an idea of how much you know to apply for that crop. Uh, if you then say, well, okay, I'm going to apply this much poultry muck, and I'm going to apply it in this way, uh, that will then tell you how much that that's likely to to provide the crop in that season. Um, and Planet as well will also give you an indication of the the losses. 
as as well. So you, you you'll be able to do it all there uh, in, in, uh, at the same time. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Uh, Pete, has there been any work done by HDB or ADAS on polymer nitrogen pro products, which you speak about, which you mentioned? Yes, unfortunately, ADAS hasn't. So, you know, I put it up there as a, as a potential route to improving efficiency, but uh, we haven't. Um, we are, however, in the process of doing a review for DEFRA to understand the value of all sorts of nutrient efficient uh, products, including those, um, and that will be reported in the spring of next year. So hopefully we'll get some information on that soon. Pete, is if the reduction is the reduction in yield for a given re reduction of kilograms of N applied dependent on the yield of the crop, i.e. if the crop was originally destined to yield eight tonnes or ten tonnes a hectare? No, it's a very good question. Um, and it, it, it isn't. So the figures I give, you know, they, they will be applicable for a 12 tonne crop or an eight tonne crop uh, because you're moving backwards from the economic optimum and the shape of the curve, whether or not it's an eight tonne crop or a 12 tonne crop is the same. So you lose the same amount of yield for that amount of fertiliser reduction. And what do you think when when somebody's purchased their N source as a as a part of a compound, what's the most reliable way of them assessing the cost of the nitrogen within that compound? Yeah, I don't know whether Mark sort of think about this one or not. Have you have you looked into that at all, Mark? Oh, I think you're muted. No, I haven't really looked at it uh, in detail, but it, it's certainly a good question. One to maybe look at, um, but there's there's obviously different ways we can do that. Um, I mean, look at your sort of pound per kilo of nitrogen uh, in that uh, particular fertilizer is one way. The uh, look at possibly the ratio uh, as well between what uh, what expected yield is supposed to have and the uh, uh, the nitrogen. Um, that you apply as well might be another but um no it's it's yeah there's, there's different ways you could do it i'm yeah i haven't got any uh, definitive answer on that one i think i think when we do it we if you for example you've got a nitrogen sulfur product then we, we just take a a standalone sulfur product uh, and work out the cost of each kilogram of sulfur in that product and then use that subtract that from the uh, cost of the nitrogen sulfur products and what's left is the cost of the nitrogen. So that's the way we do it. We just, we just take an, another product which is sort of pure or you know, elemental other, um, of the other nutrient. Brilliant. Thank you, Pete. Um, if, right, sorry, I'm just picking out, there's quite a few questions coming in. What, What's your advice? I think this one's for Mark. What's the advice on what price to use for your nitrogen when you're doing these calculations? So if you bought early, do you use the price you paid or do you use the replacement cost expected for next season? For example, if you believe that nitrogen for 2023 will not drop back to previous levels and you say it'll be around 400 pound a tonne, what price should you use? I'd make it relevant for the crop that you're using it on. So, you know, if you're looking at your 2022 harvest crop, um, use the fertilizer price that you bought it in at for that, then you're going to use on that crop. Um, so that means you've got then the, the actual cost of production um, for that crop then. Um, but you could uh, say in, in using that calculator, you can look at different scenarios. So you could look at different scenarios if you wanted to, if you're going to buy your fertilizer over, over different periods of time, um, so if you've still got some fertilizer to buy, maybe this, this winter or into spring, um, you, you could put something in to look at that and then apply that against the 2022 crop. Thanks, Mark. Pete, um, if the media were to be believed, then there's some pretty exceptional um, efficiencies that can be made from using liquid nitrogen. Is there any research to, to, to back this up? So really, is liquid versus granular, what are your thoughts? Yeah, we haven't done a test, unfortunately, it's, and we need to because we get the questions every year. Um, I mean, certainly I think there's an advantage in terms of the accuracy 
uh, compared with solid, especially if you're sort of comparing it against um, sort of spinning disk. But in terms of you know the inherent efficiency, I mean there's there's no there isn't evidence that's clear around that shows that liquid is more efficiently taken up. You know, and the question often comes up whether it's taken up more efficiently in a dry conditions, for example. Um, but you know, we look around at the literature, there isn't any evidence for it. We need to do some trials, I must admit, to, to test that. Mm -hmm. Pete, if livestock manures are available for application to cereal crops in spring, would you still reduce the inorganic nitrogen inputs by 50 kgs from the remaining balance, or would you see the organic manure nitrogen as free fertilizer and keep the inorganic N at a higher rate? Um, let's think. So I, I would, if I was using manure, I would I'd be using RB209 to work out what my bag to end requirement was uh, after accounting for the nitrogen that the manure would deliver. Uh, and I would still be reducing it by the 50 kilograms, for example, per hectare, even if I was getting you know another 20 or 30 from the from the manure. So I think we still got to reduce it by by the same amount. Mark, have you got a comment on that? I'm sort of thinking on the feet of it here. No, I haven't, I'm afraid, no. Because yeah. I mean, no, ultimately, thoughts, RB, so, I think. use RB 209 to work out the bagged end rate, and, and that would account for any manure end. So all the sort of advice is how much you knocking down the RB 209 recommended rate by. So I, I think the same would apply um, where, when you're using some manure end. I mean, the same would apply if you've got a residual, a high residual end, for example, a high soil nitrogen supply, you're still going to be reducing that recommended optimum end rate by the same amount for different fields with different residual ends. So the same principle applies, I think, to whether or not you're using manure end. Pete, how, should, how much should the pH content be taken into account when, when thinking about this? I don't know. Um, and pH can obviously affect the availability of uh, lots of nutrients and it sort of affects different nutrients at different pHs. Uh, and if you've got a very high pH or very low one and, it's, and there's another nutrient which comes into play which is going to limit yield, then you've just got to build that into what your yield potential is going to be based on that. But direct effects of pH on the nitrogen requirement, I can't think of any uh, reasons you take into account. Pete stated that nitrogen requirement was related to yield, but Mark showed that data data proved that there was no strong relationship to yield. How should we take expected yield into account, and is there an accurate method that we can use to predict yield? Can Pete, can I come yeah. to you with that? Yeah, that's fine. And it's a good question. The question comes up a lot. Um, so when we when we've done all our nitrogen response experiments and we've correlated the economic optimum end rate against the uh, yield, then we do find a, a positive correlation. It's not always that strong, admittedly, but it's still a positive correlation, which led us to believe that we should be taking into account the expected yield when working out the nitrogen requirement. Uh, and, and the sort of rule of thumb is an extra 20 kilograms of N per hectare for every extra tonne per hectare of cereal yield, for example. It's very difficult to estimate what the expected yield is. You can only really base it on, on the experience, that field, um, the state of a crop in the spring. Um, so, and, and, you, and you just, I think, the important take-home point is, is not to be too optimistic about what the potential yield is um, and be realistic. Pete, a few so, people have have asked um, through, through the listed through here, kind of the relationship between fungicides and disease management and, and nitrogen. What's your, what's your, what, what's your kind of overview there? Is there a large impact? Well, when you 
when you put higher rates of nitrogen, you do you do increase the nitrogen content of the leaves, and that does um, encourage certain pathogens, which we call biotropic pathogens, such as yellow rust in particular. Mildew is very responsive to higher N rates. Um, Septoria is a sort of a hemi so it's a bit in between. It's not as um, responsive to high N as, as rusts and mildews. Um, so, but when you're sort of working in the region we're working in of, of sort of either the optimum N rate if you bought your price fertilizer at normal prices or 50 kilograms less, it's not going to make much difference. It really isn't to the level of disease. It's only when you really start to get down to half of N rates or less that you're going to start to reduce the uh, disease pressure. And even then, it's mainly rusts and mildews. Mark, you don't have to answer it. It's just a comment to, to back it up. And Andrew's written, um, I've just tested the calculator um, with urea at 320 uh, with a typical application of 220 kgs per hectare with a wheat price of 200. It has recommended an increase of 20 kilograms per hectare, uh, resulting in a reduced margin of four pounds per hectare. And that's not what I expected. So it was good to, to see. Um, Helen, is there a tax imported on, on imported urea? Do you know? Uh, not off the top of my head, I don't know, I'm afraid. I can have a look into it, but um, right. easily find it and we can post it somewhere as a response, but I don't know. Should growers be looking to hedge high input costs with sales at, at what remains high grain prices? I think it's worth considering. It's it's always an individual decision for every business on every farm. Um, as what what works for one person isn't going to work for another but it is definitely something to think about is that the prices that we the forward prices we've got for next harvest at the moment are high but there's uncertainty about whether they'd still be that high when we get to harvest so it's it's just something it is something to have a think about brilliant Richard, can uh, I just update my answer to the grain protein as a guide to nitrogen I, I, I think it, it should be a good guide, even if there's other limiting factors, because if you, for example, got low P limiting yield, you end up with um, a high protein concentration because you've got low yield and you've applied lots of nitrogen. So that tells you, well, you've applied too much N, um, but you've only applied too much N because the yield was limited by not enough phosphorus. So it it should work even if there's other limiting factors and it tells you something about the crop you know that um, that maybe it wasn't nitrogen limiting yield it was something else so it should, should work across uh, a range of situations brilliant cheers pete are foliar feeds a viable option as an alternative to nitrogen fertilizer do you think they are but it's not easy to deliver the quantities you know that you would get through soil applied end so you know you can deliver some some of it through foliar feeds and you know potentially there's, there's an advantage in that you can bypass the inefficient soil process of and being locked up by microbes in the soil but on the on the other side of a cloying you've got to watch out for lateralization and gaseous losses like that so it's a bit of a six of one and a half dozen either. Helen, have future world stocks been adjusted for reduced nitrogen levels as a result of price and availability? No, not yet. So the, the stocks at the moment are forecast for effectively the end of June 2022 as to what we'd take into the 22-23 marketing year. Um, there aren't really many forecasts yet for next year's so the 22-23 the marketing season production or where they are, they are country by country. And I think at the moment, most of the ones I've seen are working on sort of fairly typical yield levels. But there is definitely concern about it. Um, the earliest concerns are relating to what area gets to go in the ground um, as to whether we see further shifts between different crops, particularly thinking in America would the maize area lose out to soybeans because of the higher fertilizer requirements for maize over soybeans. So will we see more area shift into soybeans than, into, uh, than lose area for maize? 
but um, it is something that is going to come up quite a bit in the next year as people start to make their forecasts for next harvest as to what those crops look like do people various places around the world because it's not just us that are suffering with high fertilizer prices it is a, a global phenomenon and it is coming through so not yet but I, I expect there will be quite a lot of discussion around it and certain places to start to factor it in at times brilliant thank you helen um we'll draw it to the close now but last one quite hopefully a simple one peter is the nitrogen fertilizer adjustment calculator relevant to all cereal crops so winter barley spring barley yep yeah we looked at uh, spring barley winter wheat winter barley so and yeah that's it those three cereals and and actually the the sort of response works for all three of those cereals in exactly the same way yes brilliant we didn't look Thank at you. we didn't look at oats though so that's that's that was missing great awesome thank you very much pete uh the final comment that popped up on all, all this chat and hundreds of things coming through <laughs> which i can't keep up with them all um was andrew melton um from over at the wisp east monitor farm said he'll be looking at um carrying on for what pete mentioned about doing our on-farm trials yourself um, he'll be doing it and uh, he's the Wisp Beach monitor farmer so we'll be promoting all the, the findings from that so Excellent. Andrew would look, Sounds look very good. To that. Brilliant. Well, I'm, I'm sure you'll be there at some point in the next three years Pete. Really? Look conscious of the time um, gone over I could have gone on we could have gone on for another two hours with the amount of um, things coming in <laughs> but thank you to all my speakers uh, today thank you James thank you Pete thank you Mark and thank you Helen. Um, it's really kind of brought quite a rounded view in, into this huge topic that we're we're talking in, about, and um, and thank you for bringing your your perspectives and your your knowledge and insights to it. Um, so all that leads me to do is this is the last webinar for series and all seeds before Christmas. So um, I hope you've all been good this year, and, and Santa's visiting everybody, and I, I hope you all have a good break. Um, it's been a busy year, so make sure you take it. So, but thank you very much to to the speakers and to the audience for being so willing today. All right, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.